Thank you very much and good afternoon. Today I want to talk to you uh, about a topic that for quite a while has been important in developing countries. That is, how can societies uh, get a regulatory system that's going to uh, allow them to have a healthy but safe financial system, one that will stimulate growth but protect them from crises. Rich countries thought they had solved this problem a long time ago, uh, but faith in that explanation blew up along with the financial system in the U.S. and Europe in about 2007. Um, as we'll see, as I'll argue, there are some lessons from sports that I think apply to crises and at least one way that we can uh, mitigate crises. Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel laureate, has compared the financial sector to the brain of the economy. It allocates resources around the economy. When it functions well, the economy functions well. When it's in crisis, it misallocates those resources. Recall the U.S in the years in the run-up to the crisis, we were uh, throwing a lot of resources at housing and finance, not clearly sectors that were gonna help us improve our long-run uh, economic growth. Uh, when the crisis happens, economies uh, suffer. Crises can be terribly uh, expensive, so there are a time when people try to remove their resources from the financial sector, uh, not often as orderly as the British do when they were lining up outside Northern Rock. And when they take their deposits out, it's often quite a while before they have the confidence to bring their resources back in. That reduces the financial sector ability to help the economy. Uh, however, in many crises, the impact can be much more severe. This is a picture from Greece a couple of months ago where the crisis is really putting uh, great strains on the entire social fabric. Now, there are many different causes of crises. Uh, it's often said you get two economists in the room, you get three explanations. There are many more explanations about crises. Macroeconomists cite macro factors such as uh, easy monetary policy, asset bubbles, overvalued exchange rates. Uh, all those factors are important in explaining crises. Microeconomists will cite micro factors, financial deregulation, uh, doing things like repealing um, the Glass-Steagall Act in the U.S. Uh, is mentioned by some. Other things may be financial innovation, new financial products coming about, the micro aspects of the housing bubble, namely the occurrence of subprime uh, lending. And my favorite explanation, uh, not because I believe it, is the perfect storm explanation. That is that all of these factors took place and caused a perfect storm. This is actually a perfect excuse because if it really couldn't be anticipated, then nobody could be blamed for, for not doing their job. Uh, Jim Barth and Ross Levine and I, in a book called The Guardians of Finance, come up with yet another possible explanation. And in most crises, many of these explanations may hold. But the one that we focus on is one that nobody's talking about, and that is that regulators did not do their job in enforcing regulations that were on the books. And that was a factor in the, uh, in the crisis. The chart on the left shows real housing prices in the U.S. from 1890 to, you see the spike from the late 90s to 2006. That jump in housing prices was truly without precedent in U.S. history. The regulators knew it and they watched. They let it happen. Um, on the right, what they also watched is in that pie chart, uh, you see on the right side of the pie chart, the uh, bank's portfolio in residential mortgages, commercial real estate loans, construction loans, it got to half of the bank's portfolios. What we know from history is whenever uh, real estate lending gets to be that large in the banking sector, we get a crisis all the time. Okay? So again, the regulators saw that uh, uh, and they didn't act. Uh, the Fed, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, other financial regulators. The Securities and Exchange Commission, another regulator of investment banks and financial markets, uh, also played a role in this crisis. In the early 2000s, the investment banks came to the SEC and they said, look, the European regulators are telling us that we can't do business in Europe unless we have one agency that is a consolidated supervisor of all of our activities around the world. And if we don't have one, they're going to do it and they're going to be really tough on us. And the SEC said, don't worry, we'll do it. That would have been fine. And the SEC was testifying before Congress saying that they had established a successful consolidated supervision program, but the problem was they hadn't. 
They had practiced almost unilateral regulatory disarmament, getting rid of divisions that supervise the investment banks. They had seven people responsible for all the investment banks that had more assets than three or four industrial countries like Canada and Britain and France put together. Uh, and the uh, group that was in charge of systemic risk, one person. We think that was clearly inadequate. The SEC was also in charge of overseeing the ratings agency and there were widespread problems where the rating agencies were using substandard models. They had been written about in the literature, all their flaws, uh, and yet the SEC did, um, did nothing. One managing director from Moody's said that the errors that they were making make us look either incompetent or like we sold our, uh, our souls to the devil for revenue. And uh, an S&P employee put it even better, let's hope we're all uh, wealthy and out of this place by the time this house of cards falters. Now what was going on was that throughout the economy, the incentive system was changing dramatically. Uh, and including in the rating agencies, the people working there were being rewarded on the basis of volume. So for the rating agencies, how many securities could they originate? Now I know this wouldn't happen here, but in some universities, if they decided to pay professors on the basis of their class size, some professors would figure out that if you give out all A pluses, you're gonna have a big class and a nice big bonus. That's what was going on in the rating agencies. The regulators knew about it and they didn't do anything. This problem of regulatory inaction was not limited to the United States. Uh, when the crisis hit European countries, they were starting to blame uh, the U.S. saying that they were just the victims of the U.S. crisis. Well, we don't think that that's the case, but what's uh, interesting is that now in Iceland and Ireland and the U.K. and other countries, they've done in-depth reports of what went wrong in their financial sectors, and their conclusion is they don't think it was their, our fault either. They think the crisis would have happened regardless of the U.S. crisis, that their crises were entirely homegrown. What went on? Same thing as in the U.S. The regulators were basically sitting on their hands watching a lot of risks grow in the sector. Uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland uh, said in a report in 2010 that they had a regulatory approach that was excessively deferential and accommodating, uh, unwilling to rock the boat or spoil the party. Let me give you just one example. Anglo-Irish Bank in Ireland was growing at a rate of 40% a year for a decade. Now in Supervision 101, they are taught that no bank survives growth beyond 15 to 20% a year. When you have a bank growing beyond that, you need to get in as a supervisor and stop it. And supervisors have legal powers where they can fire bank officers, they can stop bank lending. In Ireland, what they did was they wrote a letter to Anglo-Irish Bank saying we're concerned about what's going on and they waited two and a half years without getting a response. <laughs> <clears throat> that was really a problem of regulatory inaction and there are plenty of examples that we have in the book of Iceland and the UK where, uh, and even worse ones in, um, uh, in Ireland. Now why is it that regulators were not doing their job? Why were they taking actions that were favorable to the industry rather than protecting taxpayers' uh, interests. One possibility is the, what Hegel would say that we can't learn. Uh, Hegel said what experience in history teaches this, that nations and governments have never learned anything from history. One possibility. A second possibility is it's too complex. The financial sector is so complicated, they had all these instruments that were hard to understand, CDOs, CDO squares. How can you understand what's going on? Well, first in the US, it's true that we had these complications, but every night on TV, everybody in this audience saw advertisements that you could get a loan without providing any information about yourself. That told everyone, including the regulators, that somebody was taking a lot of risk making these loans. Um, Iceland, Ireland, the UK, there was no significant financial regulation going on. It was plain vanilla banking, outrageous growth of the financial sector, and the regulators didn't stop it. My favorite example is a poet named Katie Lutterer who wrote a book of poetry, The Heaven Sent Leaf. It's all about bubbles, like financial bubbles bursting. She predicted the crisis in 2005. Now can't we ask our financial regulators to be at least as astute as poets are or demand that the regulators hire more poets? <laughs> Why is it that the regulators don't intervene? 
Why do they rule in favor of industry? Well, one possibility is that they're captured by the industry, that uh, regulators are doing it because they want a job in the private sector, and if you regulate the banks hard, they're not going to offer you a very good job. That happens in some countries, it happens in some agencies. There's a revolving door, SEC, Treasury, New York Fed, not so much the Federal Reserve Board in, in Washington. And in fact, uh, two of the three uh, uh, authors of the Guardians of Finance worked at regulatory agencies, and we didn't see that many people leaving, and they all looked like they were trying to do a good job. So what else could be going wrong? Well, it may be human nature. Uh, a, a great book by a finance professor, uh, Toby Moskowitz from the University of Chicago, and John Wertheim, a Sports Illustrated uh, columnist, try to explain a lot of mysteries in sports. And one of them is, why is it over all time, for all the sports that are refereed, home teams win more games than visiting teams? That's a puzzle. Um, many people think they know the answer. They think that it's the impact of the uh, fans on the players. And uh, what Moskowitz and Wertheim do is throw a lot of data at this, uh, looking at the impact of the fans. Uh, they take one situation, for example, in basketball, where a basketball player is out the foul line. It's just the player, the ball, the basket, and of course the fans. And if the visiting team player is on the foul line, they're doing their best to try to distract that player. If it's a home team player shooting a foul shot, they're as quiet as they might be in church. Well, what Moskowitz and Wertheim show us is the percentage of foul shots sunk by home teams and visiting teams is identical to the second decimal place. If the fans have no impact at a time when their impact should be at its maximum, maybe they don't have any impact at all. And we go over a lot of the other examples, but you should see their book uh, where they go into great detail uh, and they can find no statistical evidence that the fans have an impact on the players. Some people think it's climate. Teams from the south can't play uh, good in the north where it's cold. That's rubbish. There's again no statistical difference. Uh, some people think the visiting team is worn out by commuting. Well, when the baseball players in the early 20th century were commuting by bus, uh, they had the same disadvantage playing on somebody else's home field as when teams commute by jet or the Mets and the Yankees uh, in baseball who only have to commute across town. And it's the same home field advantage in the Netherlands where, excuse me, the soccer players don't have to go very far at all. So what they come up with is that it's the impact of the fans on the referees. One example in baseball, uh, umpires calling balls and strikes. Using electronic cameras and the data that was gathered from them, what they find is that when the visiting team is at bat, the strike zone is 25% larger than when the home team is at bat. When you tell the referees, the, tell the umpires, that there are now electronic cameras on them, the home field advantage goes away. Okay? When you take an umpire from the Mets and move him over to the Yankees, his bias in favor of the Yankees uh, immediately switched, his allegiance uh, switched. So we think there's persuasive evidence that there really is a, a psychological bias. People want to be liked. Even nonconformists want to be liked. Uh, they just have a different way of going about it. Uh, and in the financial sector, the home field are the bankers. They have the plush box seats uh, right on the field, and the public is sitting way up in the nosebleed seats. They can't see what's going on. They don't understand the game at all, and they, so they have no influence. One example of the way the bankers have influence on the regulators is on the meetings that the Fed holds to uh, discuss financial regulation. When I was there in the late 70s, early 80s, there were a lot of meetings that were open to the public. Anybody could come in and request information, express an opinion on regulation. As you see in the chart on the left, those meetings have virtually disappeared. And what's replaced them, the chart on the right, is uh, uh, an explosion of meetings. This is just in the last year on the Volcker Rule and derivatives that uh, the banks have been having uh, with the Fed. So they get a lot of access uh, uh, to the regulators. Now, whether it's um, uh, regulatory capture or this psychological uh, bias, the next question is, well, why do the regulators get away with it? How do we 
let the, as society, let them get away with it? Well, the answer is, of course, we don't have the information that they have. We don't have the skills that, uh, that they have uh, to be able to assess the information that they are gathering. And so what we propose is to take a, a, a page from uh, the practice in sports and uh, let's have some monitoring of regulators. Uh, we need a form of instant replay. We call the group that we propose uh, a small watchdog agency that we dub the Sentinel that will be there to oversee the regulators. As with the group of experts that's put together after a plane crash, whose sole uh, job is to produce information. They have no regulatory power, and we're not proposing a sentinel that can pass any regulations at all. But what we want them to do is to have access to all the information that the various financial regulators are gathering, and to be able to publish a report uh, and say what the regulators are doing about the systemic risks that exist. So for example, in 2004, the FBI turned over a confidential report to the Federal Reserve Board saying there was widespread fraud going on in the mortgage market. What did the Fed do? Nothing. If there had been a sentinel and the Fed knew that their inaction could be disclosed, that might have actually prompted them to look into the fraud and maybe slow down the lending. The Fed had the power to really shut off the lending in, uh, in mortgage markets if it wanted to. Or in the case of Ireland, if they had had an Irish Sentinel, which by the way, they've actually started now after the crisis, if they had an Irish Sentinel, that agency could have exposed the fact that the Irish regulator was just sitting on their hands and taking no action at all in the face of large risks. Now, there's a type of economist who goes into a, a, a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there and screams, I've got it. Um, I, I don't want you to think that I've fallen into that trap. I don't claim that this will cure or end all financial crises. But for all those causes that I, saw, that I cited, the macro causes, easy monetary policy, uh, huge capital flows, overvalued exchange rates, good luck changing that. People have been trying to reform the international monetary system for a long time with no progress. Uh, many people thought monetary policy was doing a good job in the early 2000s etc. Um, you may want to change people's behavior, get rid of the excess optimism when interest rates go down so that people don't overborrow or that bankers don't overlend. Again, good luck with changing human psychology. But this is something we should be able to change. Regulators should work for the public, so we should be able to fix this problem. Until we do, the world that we're going to live in is going to be first a world in which we'll continue to engage in the knee-jerk response to financial crises, and that knee-jerk response is, let's pass more regulations. The Dodd-Frank bill is 2,300 pages, hugely complicated, and Ben Bernanke is saying the central bank doesn't have the tools to study the net impact of all these changes. In other words, with all the regulations that have been passed, he doesn't know what's going on. That's disconcerting to say the least. So we think we need a different approach to regulation, one that focuses less on expanding the number of rules and more on giving the regulators incentives to actually do their job. Until we get there, this is the world we're going to live in. Soccer is a sport with no instant replay. This was the famous hand of God, Diego Maradona, going up about ready to give the ball its fist to score a goal. Um, uh, that's, they're playing in Latin America, Argentina against England, and on the far left, the gentleman you see there dressed in black, is the referee. There's no obstacle that I can see between his eyes and that ball, but he called it in favor of Argentina. Now, I don't know whether it was because he was biased by the crowds, whether he was paid off by somebody, whether he was in fear of his life if he made the wrong call, but what I want is some type of oversight that's going to stop him from making those calls. I think that uh, until we do that, we're going to be condemned to having expensive crises, and our children and our grandchildren are going to pay for that. I think we can do better. Thank you.